Jesus is baptized at the beginning of his ministry, and at the end of his time on earth, he tells his followers that every believer should have an experience like that in their journey. Now, I was baptized when I was eight years old, but my journey hasn't always lived up to that moment. I've wandered, I've doubted, and sometimes I've just rebelled against God. So it begs the question, what was my baptism for? Was it inauthentic? Was it a, a poor attempt at an empty ritual? or a rite of passage that didn't stick? What's the point of a moment like that if our journey will still have its struggles? I mean, what is baptism and why does it matter so much to Jesus? It turns out, as is often the case with Jesus, that there's actually a story behind the story. And the story behind the story in Jesus' baptism is the Exodus. When the Hebrew people were in Egypt, they weren't really a people at all. They were just a bunch of poor, extended family living in somebody else's country where they were property. Every day they went to work and they were reminded that they had no identity, no rights, no freedom by the lashes that hit their backs when they couldn't make enough bricks to keep up with the thriving economy of Egypt. Can you imagine the feeling of the lashes on your back when you couldn't keep up with the demands of your taskmasters? I mean, how about you? Have you ever come home from a day of work and felt like your identity was nothing more than a cog in a machine? Maybe you feel like even the people who are closest to you in life would rather use you than know you. What happens to our identity when the loudest voices are the ones that beat us down? So God looks down and he sees the Hebrew people and he sees that they know themselves as slaves and workhorses, but they don't know themselves as children of God, and he decides to do something about it. So he sends Moses into Pharaoh's courts. Moses says, let the people go. Pharaoh says no, and God sends devastating plagues on the nation of Egypt. Eventually, Pharaoh relents, and for the first time in generations, the Israelite people are free. They walk out of Egypt to become their own people. They come up against the waters of the Red Sea, and at that point, Pharaoh changes his mind, and he sends his armies to get them. And what do you do when you think that God has saved you and then you're not so sure? What do you do when doubt and struggle enter in? Maybe you don't do anything. Maybe God comes through. God sends Moses to lead. He puts his hands outstretched over the waters of the Red Sea and the waters literally part as the people of Israel walk through on dry ground. Now Pharaoh's armies think they can get to them, so they pursue them, except as they enter the Red Sea, the waters come back in and swallow them up. And all of a sudden, you're Israel. You've been saved twice already. You're standing on dry ground. You've come up out of the water. You keep reading, though. And after God brings Israel out of the water, you sort of wonder if he bet on the wrong horse. Because they still have struggles on their journey. They still have problems along the way. In fact, there are moments when you flat out wonder if they lost their identity again after their Red Sea moment. It's like they keep listening to these voices that whisper to them or shout to them and say, you're not who you think you are. But maybe that's the point. God didn't bring them through the water because they would be perfect. He brought them through the water because he knew that they would wander and that they would need an anchor in their story, a tether to their identity when lies get shouted at them about who they are in their future. Now, baptism for Jesus doesn't just look back to the Exodus. It looks forward to, because our deliverance didn't happen at the Red Sea with Moses' arms extended. It happened at the cross with Jesus' arms outstretched. We weren't rescued from Pharaoh's army. Now we've been saved from the slavery of sin. It's not the waters that cleanse us, but they symbolize a life that has gone to the cross with Jesus and come up from the grave with a new identity of freedom in Him. As we're gonna have moments when we're tempted to believe that we're the old us instead of the new us. You're gonna have voices screaming at you that say that you're not holy, you don't belong to Him, you aren't loved, but you and I are given a moment to step into the waters to feel grace wash over us from head to toe. Jesus says be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your sins may seem to pursue you, 
but they've been drowned in the blood of Christ shed at the cross. We've been renamed, reclaimed by Jesus. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. We are children of God. Engage in a defiant act of protest against the voices of shame that chase you and tell the world that you belong to him. grateful for tonight. We are so grateful for this time right now where we get to honor you with the symbolic act of baptism, the symbolism of life change. Lord, I pray just a prayer of thanksgiving in this Thanksgiving week. Lord, as we get this week started, Lord, what a beautiful way to begin the week. I pray, Lord, that tonight this would be an aroma pleasing to you, a sacrifice of time, a sacrifice of life. And as we lay down our lives, Lord, we know, Lord, we find it in you. We find true life in you. And so, Lord, I pray tonight, as we honor you through this time of baptism, Lord, we ask that this be pleasing to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 37, I'm going to read. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, best phrase in the whole thing, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And tonight, guys, we've got some beloved, or we have a beloved son and a beloved daughter in which God is truly well pleased tonight. So you guys come on up this way. As they're making their way this way, I want to make sure that we're perfectly clear on what we're doing tonight. This time right now in this water, there is nothing magical about this water. This water here is simply water. But what's magical and what's amazing and what is remarkable is what's happened in these young people's lives before tonight. And so tonight, as we baptize them, we want to do everything we can to follow the example of Jesus. And so when we follow the example of Jesus, as he was baptized, we're going to follow him in that. And we want to make sure that we understand that just as Jesus died on a cross, was buried, really dead, he rose again after the third day, really alive, and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne of the Father. These guys here have laid down their lives and said yes to Jesus. Because they've said yes to Jesus, it's as if the old life is gone and there's been a rebirth. Another, another birth. And as they come up out of the water, it is the symbolism that they're new. And they are a new creation that is being made new. They're still working out their salvation as you and I are. We're still working this out. But they're here tonight to tell you publicly they love Jesus and they want you to surround them and help them learn exactly what that means and what it looks like to follow his example. And so tonight, first off, we have Anderson Bobby. Come on up, Bubba. It's a little cool tonight. Just a little bit. It had, the, the heater ran out of propane. You know, uh, just a little bit into it. So anyway, Anderson uh, and I got to talk this last week. Now, Anderson accepted Christ at preteen camp this past summer. And we got to talk this last week. It was so cool when I got to talk to him. Because you know the phrase that I will never forget about our conversation this week? The phrase I'll never forget is that over and over and over again, as I asked him questions and just talked to him about what sin is and talked to him about who Jesus is and talked to him about all of these things, you know the phrase that was repeated that came out of his mouth time and time again? The phrase was, well, you know, my daddy and I, we prayed about that. You know, my daddy and I, when we prayed about that, 
we we were praying this, and then and I would ask him another question. Well, you know, we prayed about this, and I just I remember look, I was looking at him going, man, what a beautiful phrase. There could not be a better phrase to come out than with a father caring for his son, talking with him, praying through the wrestling match of what it means to to come to know Jesus. And what a beautiful example that was. You know, another phrase that I loved whenever um, I was talking with Anderson um, was he told me. Um, about midway through the conversation, he goes, I've always known Jesus loves me. And I said, well, then what was the what was the catalyst? What was the thing that said that it was time for you to pray to receive him? He said, I just felt like it was time to make it right. He's always known Jesus loved him. He's been told that since before he was even born. And as he was sitting there at preteen camp this summer, he realized it's time to make this official. And it's time to make this right. So Anderson, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? Yes. Are you confused? No. No, it's okay. All right. Right hand on that nose, buddy. All right. Then Anderson, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. sure when the water is cold, they will never forget. <laughs> they will never forget that this took place, right? This is Emma Ann Cook, and uh, this is my girl. Uh, this is my, my, uh, my youngest of the three biological that we have. And, um, you know, a few months ago, actually several months ago, Emma came in and talked with us and she said that she felt like she was ready to be baptized. And we talked through what that meant. We talked through that. And she, she decided she was going to pray and receive Christ. And then we started talking with her about this is going to be something that is to be made public. And it, it kind of freaked her out. And she wasn't sure about that. And so we decided that we were going to hold off for a little bit. And I got to tell you, um, fear crept into me at a level I was not quite sure what to do with. And the reason for that is, is because she did not speak a word about Jesus for two months. She didn't say anything. Not at all. She didn't pray a lot at the dinner table. She didn't do those things. And the fear came over me, came over me that one of my mentors always told me, he said, you never, ever turn a child away from baptism. But that was a huge wrestling match within me because as a pastor and as a father, it's my job to make sure that folks understand and they know what they're doing so that this is a one-time deal. We've had too many people have to go through this multiple times because they weren't sure. And for two months... I was praying and I was asking God in their room at night. I'm asking, crying out to the Lord in front of them and, and, uh, and, and, and Rachel and I together. And we're just asking God to save our children. And I'm so grateful that on September the 22nd this year, I remember that because it's my bride's birthday. I walk into the kitchen and Emma and Rachel are having a conversation. I could tell it was serious. And I was so grateful whenever Rachel looked at me, and I, you know the look. Emma looks at me and she says that she's ready to make this public. And all I could do in that moment was just in me to say, thank you, Jesus. And yet another reminder that we are not the Savior of the world. But in God's fullness of time, He makes things right. He is the one who is doing the saving. It's not something we're trying to convince children to do. It's something that He is doing, changing lives. So Emma, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? Yes. Then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
the Holy Spirit. special thing to get to do. For you guys tonight, we get the privilege of partaking of both ordinances tonight. Baptism and Lord's Supper. It's last week I was talking with Rachel and um, and she had been invited to be a part of this group. This group is called the Pink Ribbon Cowgirls. And, uh, and you know, it's just silly. It's, it's funny. It's a bunch of ladies in Austin uh, that have struggled with cancer at some point, uh, maybe currently struggling with that, but she got invited to be a part of this group. And, and the person that invited her was this girl that, as Rachel was in the, the doctor's office and she was receiving some medication, uh, she was talking with this other girl who's younger than her, which is an anomaly in you know the oncologist's office for folks to be younger than us. And so as she's there talking with this girl, the girl was telling her just how important this group was and just how meaningful this group had been to her and just how, how much information, how much how wonderful it was to be a part of this group. She had moved from out of state. She was here. She didn't know anybody. There wasn't any family around. And she had this group that she could go to for support. I could tell as Rachel was telling me this story, she was wrestling through the question, why am I not drawn to this group myself? And as we were talking through this, one of the things that came to my mind is, well, everyone on the face of the planet is longing for community. Everyone longs to be a part. You know, it's the Cheers theme song, right? We want to go where everybody knows your name. They're always glad that you came. Doesn't that sound like church? Right? Or a bar? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's something, right? Everyone wants to be a part of community. They want to be known. They want to know that they're known. They want to know people are happy to see them, that they belong. And I'm so grateful that my bride, as we were talking through, was sitting there kind of going, what is the struggle here? And the struggle is, why is she not drawn to this group? Well, the reason is, is she already belongs. She is already known. She already has a support group known as the body of Christ. She already has this strong group of people who are there at the drop of a hat. She already has what everyone wants. And that is to be a part of something much larger than us as individuals. And I'm so grateful to get to have that conversation with her. Because as we sit here tonight and we talk about the Lord's Supper, we get the privilege of partaking of the Lord's Supper. This is one of the foundational pieces of our community. It's one of the foundational pieces that each of us need to understand why we belong. Why we will lay down our lives for one another. Why we will buy and sell possessions to give to anyone who has need. Why we are devoted to this thing called the apostles' teaching, scripture. Why we, why we are breaking bread together and telling each other as we sit across the table from one another, I've got you. I've got you back. I'm committed. I'm caring for you. We're in this thing together. What is the deal here? It's all because of Jesus Christ. And it's all because of his sacrifice that he made on the cross for each and every one of us. And as we partake of this, this moment called the Lord's Supper, another word is communion familiar with community, right? It helps us know why we belong. It helps us know why we are cared for it the way we are. It helps us understand that we are a part of something that is so much bigger than us. That there's a Savior of the world who died, was buried, and rose again for each and every one of us in this room. And it's so good to belong. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in 23, it says these words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Paul says that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now Paul goes on a couple of verses later to help us understand that as we come to the table tonight and we dine, it's important that we examine ourselves. He, in verse 28, he says, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so two things to examine ourselves. Number one, do you belong? Do you belong to the community that is known as the family of God? It's important that we understand that and that we ask ourselves that question. Have we prayed and have we received the gift known as Jesus Christ? And we pray that we receive what is known as salvation, which means it saves us from ourselves so that this life that we've been living on our own selfish motivation, trying to pursue this goal, we understand that that goal is found in Jesus Christ and the life that is found in Christ is the true life and is truly the way in order to know God the Father, to spend eternity in paradise. Are we a part of of this community of God. And then the second examination is this. If you're a part of this community and you've said yes to Jesus, it's important that you examine whether you have something between you and someone else in this community. Scripture is very clear that it says if we if we come to the table and we dine with the wrong motives, then we are we are eating and drinking judgment upon ourselves. And it's important that we know that our conscience is clear and that the forgiveness is there. And so we're going to sing a song here in just a little bit. And this is a beautiful time for you to examine your life, to examine, am I part of this community of God? Have I said yes to Jesus? And then if I've said yes to Jesus, is there anything between me and someone else in here? Do I have anything against someone else? And do I need to go and make that right? And so over the course of this next song, I want to invite you to do that. To prepare your heart. And to say, God, I love you. I'm so grateful for you. And to say, Lord, I pray that you help mend the relationship, perhaps, if there might be. A problem with things. And then after that, we're going we're gonna to invite you to the table. One of our elders, Ryan is going to come up and he's going to invite you to the table. And everyone is welcome at the table. Everyone is welcome. We want to invite everyone. And if you, as you were doing your examination, you have come to the conclusion that you understand that you are a part of the family of God. You said yes to Jesus and you're a Christ follower. Then as you approach the table, we want to ask you to just have your hands out like this. And if you've not yet said yes to Jesus, and you're still pursuing and still working out that salvation, trying to figure it, all of this out. We want you to be at the table because God longs for everyone. And so if you'll just walk and put your hands across your chest here, then our elders will pray a prayer of blessing over you. And they're going to say words that are like this. They say, the Lord bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you and give you peace. And that's going to be it. What we would ask is that if you would just take your time coming up, allow the people that are at the table before you to finish, and then you come up as a family, come up as a group of friends, come up as a couple, whatever it is. We're just asking you not to come up by yourself. Bring somebody with you. Everybody's invited. Long to say yes to Jesus. And he longs for us to say yes to him. Let me pray, and then we're going to sing this song, examine ourselves, and then we'll partake. Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this time. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, he is the way to you. Lord, he is what is true about everything. And Lord, He is the way in which we live life to the fullest measure. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to realize that in our lives. I pray, Lord, that, that as you hung on that cross and 
Lord, you were buried and rose again. We understand, Lord, that you did that for each and every one of us so that we might live. And Lord, we thank you for that. And so, Lord, as we do this, let us remember you. And I pray, Lord, that you would let us remember you clearer than we've ever before tonight. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Take my hand.